Welcome to Spooky Pasta, the place where your worst nightmares come to life. Today we dive into the third part of our story. I'm a cop on the Navajo reservation. I investigated a killer who steals his victim's skin. By Page Turner 627. The ensuing moments are pure, undiluted terror. Every sound is magnified in the oppressive blackness. The frantic footsteps of those trying to escape, the desperate prayers whispered in both Navajo and English, the eerie hissing of the creatures, and the chilling, heart-rending cries of the trapped and the attacked. Flashes of light sporadically cut through the darkness like strobes, each momentary illumination revealing snapshots of horror. A mother clutching her child, eyes wild with fear. A volunteer guard taking aim with a shaking hand, firing off rounds in the direction he thinks a skinwalker is, only to have another lunge from the other side. The sickening thud of bodies falling, the heart-wrenching wails of those who witness their loved ones being taken. I can barely process the scenes before they're swallowed up by darkness again. Each flash of light feels like a gamble, a momentary advantage that could also paint a target on the one holding it. But without them, the darkness is complete, and in the darkness, the skinwalkers have the upper hand. The sound of gunfire erupts from all directions. The panic is palpable, with people firing in desperation, not knowing if they're aiming at a skinwalker or one of their own. I realize with a chilling certainty that without some form of organization, we risk becoming our own worst enemy. The last thing we need is friendly fire in our panic. Form a circle. Everyone, form a circle. Lights outwards. I bellow, hoping my voice cuts through the chaos. Izzy hears me and joins in, her authoritative tone echoing my command. Shoulder to shoulder. Hold your positions. Don't shoot unless you're certain of your target. Clutching my radio, I quickly press the transmit button, desperate to establish a connection with any outside help. This is Tohani at the community center. We're under attack. We need backup. Repeat. We need backup now. Static answers my call. My heart sinks, but I try again, adjusting the frequency in hopes of finding a clear channel. Anyone, please. We're being attacked by. I hesitate, knowing how it would sound, by something not human, grasping for any sense of direction in the pitch black. My fingers finally find Izzy's. I grip her hand tightly, the coldness of her skin evidence of the horror we're both experiencing. Izzy, I rasp, my voice barely audible over the echoing screams and the growing pandemonium. We need to get the lights back on. I find myself ducking instinctively at every shot, my heart racing with the realization that a stray bullet from a well-meaning defender could be just as deadly as an attack from the skinwalkers. We move as silently as we can, our hands brushing against walls to guide our path. The faint, haunting murmurs of the creatures are our only indication of their proximity. Their sounds are maddeningly elusive, echoing from all directions. We can't tell if they're close or far, but the sense of being hunted, of being watched, is palpable. The room with the breaker box is at the far end of the community center, a fact I curse under my breath. We have to traverse the full length of this nightmare to reach it. Suddenly, a chilling wail slices through the air, causing us both to freeze in place. It's close. Too close. I feel Izzy's grip tighten on my hand. We exchange no words, the urgency of our situation communicating everything. We continue. Our pace quickened. The oppressive silence is punctuated only by the occasional rustling or distant scream. Each sound feels like a reminder of the terror lurking in the shadows. At last, the door to the electrical room looms ahead, barely visible in the inky blackness. With bated breath, I reach for the handle, praying it's unlocked. To our relief, the door opens with a soft creak, 
revealing the faint outline of the breaker box. As I step inside, I feel an immediate sense of dread. The room, small and enclosed, feels like a trap. The sensation of being cornered, of having no way out, is overwhelming. Fumbling in the darkness, my hands finally find the array of switches. I begin flipping them desperately, praying for the return of light. But the power doesn't come back on. Panic wells up inside me, threatening to drown out rational thought. Suddenly, the unmistakable sound of footsteps echoes outside the door. Slow, deliberate, approaching with a predator's patience. Izzy's breathing grows rapid, her weapon drawn and aimed at the entrance. The footsteps grow louder, closer, until they're right outside the door. A long, malevolent silence follows. We hold our breath, waiting for the inevitable. The second stretch, each moment hanging like an eternity as the silence grows more oppressive. My fingers, slick with sweat, continue to fumble over the breaker switches, desperate for a solution. The electrical grid was outdated, and I curse myself for not paying attention during the community center's maintenance discussions. As the weight of the situation bears down on me, a memory flashes, an auxiliary generator, recently installed after the last power outage. It's manual, with a pull cord start. My eyes dart to the far end of the room, where I recall seeing it on my last visit. Without a word, I nod toward the generator to Izzy, my movement barely perceptible in the darkness. She understands and, in one fluid motion, positions herself between the door and me, creating a protective barrier. Moving as quietly as I can, I crouch down by the generator, feeling for the fuel cap. To my immense relief, it's full. My trembling fingers locate the choke and the pull cord. I brace myself, knowing the noise will draw attention. I give the cord a strong yank. The generator coughs to life, its sudden roar echoing in the confined space. The lights flicker, then glow with a reassuring brightness, illuminating the small room. As the luminance spills into the corridor beyond, the oppressive aura of darkness is banished, if only for a while. Izzy and I exchange a fleeting look of relief before cautiously venturing back into the main hall, weapons at the ready. What greets us is a panorama of horror. The once bustling community center now resembles a war zone. The aftermath of the Skinwalker's rampage is evident in every corner. Bodies lie scattered, some twisted in unnatural poses, while others seem to be in a peaceful slumber. Here and there, groups huddle, comforting one another or tending to the wounded. Elders murmur prayers over the fallen, and the air is thick with a mix of grief and shock. But as for the Skinwalkers, there are no signs. It's as if the creatures melted away with the darkness, leaving only destruction in their wake. The momentary reprieve granted by the lights flickering back on is short-lived. Just as we begin to get our bearings, a loud, forceful banging reverberates through the hall, coming from one of the side entrances. The heart-stopping echo of those bangs causes everyone to freeze, a fresh wave of terror washing over the room. The immediate thought is unanimous. A skinwalker is trying to force its way in again. Instinctively, I raise my weapon, aiming towards the door, and several others follow suit. The room, still ringing with the echoes of the recent attack, is filled with an almost tangible tension. Every eye is fixed on the entrance, every breath held in anticipation. As the banging continues, a voice rises above the din, muffled but recognizable. Navajo Nation Police, open up. Suspicion and hope war within me. Could it be a trick? But no, that voice is familiar. Lieutenant Benjamin Tahoma, an old friend. We both play on the football team in high school. He's the most dedicated officers I know. Yet caution is our ally. Ben, is that really you? I call out, trying to mask the tremble in my voice. 
Yes, Logan, it's me, comes the response, tinged with urgency. We have a SWAT team with us. We need to get inside. The pounding on the door persists, but it's Ben's voice, filled with genuine concern, that cuts through. Logan, we don't have much time. We need to get everyone out. Taking a deep breath, I shout out, Hazuji Hadasasti Inii? Is the Hogan welcoming? It's a code phrase, developed by the department after a series of incidents where assailants posed as officers to gain access to secure locations. Only those truly in the loop would know the countersign. An agonizing pause follows, during which every rustle and whisper in the room seems amplified. After what seems like an eternity, the voice responds, Shimasani Baidazi Ilgo Hazuji, as welcoming as grandmother's embrace. Relief floods through me. I motion for the others to unbar the door and let them in. The entrance swings open to reveal Lieutenant Tahoma, his familiar face etched with concern. Behind him stands the department's heavily armed SWAT team, their gear and weapons indicating they're prepared for the worst. The survivors erupt in a chorus of relieved cries and whispers. Ben approaches me, placing a reassuring hand on my shoulder. Are you okay, Logan? I nod, glancing around the room at the aftermath of the attack. We're alive, but we lost many. Ben's gaze follows mine, taking in the devastation around us. He lets out a heavy sigh. We got a distress call, but we didn't expect this. His voice is thick with emotion. I nod, the weight of the situation pressing down on me. We need to help the injured and evacuate everyone as soon as possible. We're sitting ducks here. The SWAT team fans out, moving with precision. Some of them start to secure the perimeter, while others attend to the injured alongside the community's volunteers. Izzy steps forward, her face pale but determined. I know first aid. I can help. Ben Knights. We brought medical supplies. Distribute them among those who can help. Within minutes, the community center transforms into a makeshift triage center. The injured are carefully tended to, wounds dressed and pain managed as best as possible. The cries of the wounded and the soft murmurings of comfort create a poignant backdrop to the organized chaos. Children are rounded up and kept in a central area, their wide eyes taking in everything. Volunteers distribute water and food, trying to bring a semblance of calm and normalcy. Amid the chaos, a plan of evacuation is quickly put into place. The most severely injured would be evacuated first in two armored vehicles, followed by the elderly and children, and then the rest. The SWAT team members take up strategic positions around the perimeter, ensuring that no more skinwalkers can infiltrate the community center. The armored vehicle's engine rumbles to life with Ben behind the wheel as Izzy and I climb in, the heavy door sealing behind us with a muted thud. The interior is dimly lit with a faint blue glow emanating from the dashboard's instruments. Outside, the muffled sounds of the community's chaos and cries are still audible, but they feel distant, like a fading nightmare. I can't help but glance around at the survivors, a thought gnawing at the back of my mind. The skinwalker's ability to assume the form of its victims. Every pair of eyes that meets mine, every familiar face, now carries with it a seed of doubt. Could they be one of the creatures in disguise? As the vehicle starts to move, I look over at Izzy, noticing the strain on her face. You did well back there, I say, trying to offer some comfort. She nods, her gaze distant. I just, I can't believe what happened. It's like a horror movie come to life. The armored vehicle's tires crunch on the gravel road as it meanders through the vast expanse of the reservation. The landscape outside is bathed in the pale light of the moon, casting eerie shadows that dance with the movement of our vehicle. The vast desert stretches out endlessly, interrupted occasionally by the silhouette of ancient rock formations that stand like sentinels in the night. 
We drive in relative silence, the weight of the night's events pressing down on us. Every so often, the radio crackles to life with updates from other teams coordinating the evacuation. The journey feels both endless and eerily quick, as if time itself is warping around us. Every now and then, distant howls pierce the night, serving as a chilling reminder that the skinwalkers are still out there. But as the minutes turn into hours, another sensation begins to creep over me, a subtle, pervasive feeling of being watched from a distance. The sensation is not menacing like the skinwalkers, but it's equally unsettling. The sensation of being observed grows stronger the further we travel, and it's clear I'm not the only one feeling it. Izzy shifts uneasily in her seat, her eyes scanning the horizon. Do you feel that, Logan? She whispers. I nod, my grip tightening on the wheel. It's like we're being watched. Ben, his face lit by the soft blue glow of the dashboard, speaks up. It's not just a feeling. I've noticed something on the outskirts of our vision. It's been following us for a while now. My heart rate quickens. Another skinwalker? Ben glances at me, his normally calm demeanor unsettled. No, he murmurs. This is different. It's not a skinwalker, but it's not human either. The vast desert outside seems to shrink, the horizon drawing closer as if the land itself is converging around us. The sensation of being watched intensifies until it's almost suffocating. My gaze constantly darts to the mirrors, catching fleeting glimpses of something just out of sight. The landscape outside is a blur, a vast expanse of desert punctuated by the occasional gnarled tree or rocky outcrop. But my attention is drawn to a shadowy figure on the periphery, moving with unnatural speed and determination. At first, it's just a silhouette against the moonlit horizon, but as the seconds pass, it becomes increasingly clear. A figure on horseback, galloping with relentless purpose. My pulse quickens, and my fingers grip the armrests of my seat. Ben, I mutter, nodding toward the rearview mirror. Do you see that? His eyes narrow as he focuses on the approaching figure. Yeah, I see him. Who the hell is that? Izzy, her gaze fixated on the mysterious rider, murmurs. He's coming up fast. The horse and its rider seem to defy the laws of physics, closing the distance between us at an astonishing rate. The rhythmic pounding of hooves grows louder, echoing through the still desert night like the beat of a war drum. The rapid, rhythmic beating of hooves grows louder, drowning out the sounds of the armored vehicle's engine. As the horseman draws closer, details of his appearance become disturbingly clear. He wears an eerie black mask that completely shrouds his face, making it impossible to discern any human features. The mask seems to absorb the moonlight, its surface shimmering with an unsettling darkness. His body is covered in a stark white paint, the patterns reminiscent of ancient tribal markings. His clothes, made of what appears to be coarse fur and interwoven with rawhide, ripple as he rides, giving him a feral and primal appearance. Clutched in one hand is a gleaming lever-action rifle, reflecting the sparse light and contrasting sharply with the obsidian darkness of his attire. Despite the unsettling visage, it's the horseman's eyes that capture my attention. They burn with a fiery intensity, glowing like red-hot embers in the depths of a furnace. Those eyes is fierce determination and infilled with something profoundly ancient, lock onto mine, and an icy shiver runs down my spine. As the distance between us narrows, the desert landscape seems to warp and shift, as if reality itself is bending in the presence of this otherworldly figure. The horse on which he rides is equally disturbing, with smoky tendrils of mist curling up from its hooves leaving no trace of their passage on the ground below. Suddenly, 
the horseman turns to face us directly. He lets out a bone-chilling battle cry that reverberates across the vast expanse of the desert, echoing off the distant rock formations. The sound is both primeval and ethereal, echoing with the weight of countless centuries. It's a call to arms, a declaration of intent, and a challenge all rolled into one. Every fiber of my being screams at me to look away, to escape from the piercing gaze of this desert phantom. But I can't. I'm transfixed, caught in his magnetic pole. The mysterious horseman raises his gleaming rifle, pointing it skyward. Without hesitation, he pulls the trigger, and a brilliant flare erupts from the barrel, lighting up the night like a bolt of lightning. The sudden illumination is so intense, it's as if the sun itself has made a brief reappearance, casting everything into sharp relief. For a few seconds, the vast desert landscape becomes as clear as day. The brightness reveals a sight that makes my blood run cold. Lurking in the shadows, hidden behind rock formations and emerging from the sparse vegetation, are the skinwalkers. Their grotesque forms, a perverse mix of man and beast, are now laid bare in the eerie light. Their eyes, pale and malevolent, reflect the light, giving them an even more demonic appearance. Some crawl on all fours, their elongated limbs contorting in ways no human should. Others stand erect, their twisted forms draped in tattered rags that barely conceal their gnarled, skeletal frames. I can see the anticipation in their movements, the hunger in their eyes. They've been stalking us, waiting for the right moment to strike, using the darkness as their ally.